William Wallace Denslow was best known as the illustrator of the book The Wizard of Oz, but he created much more than that and deserves greater recognition as one of the most significant pioneers of modern picture book illustration. He was born in Philadelphia in 1856 and other than a few unproductive months of formal art education he was self-taught. It's claimed that by the age of 16 he was getting work published in magazines, although no evidence of this appears to have survived. He settled in Chicago in 1893 where he worked as a freelance illustrator, but again there's no evidence of his work until 1898 when he met the writer L. Frank Baum and they decided to collaborate on a book project. Father Goose was published in 1899 and it quickly became the best-selling book of the year. Following this success they worked together again and this time the remarkable result was The Wonderful Wizard of Oz. For the book Denslow created a series of calligraphic line illustrations with tightly controlled pen and ink. Some were printed as monochromes and others used unusual combinations of spot colour applied a printing to Denslow's precise instructions. The book's success was immediate and unprecedented and gave both the author and the artist celebrity status. The next year they published Dot and Tot of Maryland, but the story was nowhere near as engaging as The Wizard of Oz and it received a rather lukewarm reception. Away from his partnership with Baum, Denslow did have some success with his character Billy Bounce, which was first published in 1901 as a comic strip and subsequently in book form. Which was just as well because his association with Baum ended abruptly and acrimoniously in 1902. They had planned to create a stage musical of The Wizard of Oz, but the plans disintegrated into a serious disagreement over money. They couldn't reconcile their differences and Denslow left for New York. Unusually for an illustrator, he had a keen business sense and had negotiated generous royalty payments for his work with Baum and also retained the copyright to visual portrayals of the characters. Which meant he was free to create comic strips and spin-off books and didn't have to share the royalties. And in the next few years he illustrated more books than seemed humanly possible, including 18 of his own. All of them sold in large numbers, and with the vast amount of money he had made, he bought a small island in Bermuda and built a lavish white mansion on it. But for reasons I can't on earth, a few years later his career went into sharp decline. Sales of his books plummeted and he was finding it increasingly difficult to get published. There were three failed marriages to pay for, and staffing and maintaining a mansion on a private island wouldn't be cheap and some of his failed projects, such as an attempted stage musical of the book The Pearl and the Pumpkin, were financially disastrous. But continuing royalty payments alone should have protected him, and how he came to have such financial problems is baffling. Whatever the cause, Denslow began drinking heavily, and his increasing unreliability only made his decline that much faster. And in 1915, following a three-day drinking binge, he passed out in an alley, caught pneumonia, and died at the age of 58. The remarkably distinctive poster artist Achille Mozan was born in 1883 in the French Riviera town of Gap. And having studied at the School of Fine Art in Lyon, he relocated to Milan in 1905. There he set himself up as an illustrator and was soon creating magazine illustrations and posters. After a few years in Milan, he moved to Turin, and by this point, posters were dominating his output. Nevertheless, he was also creating sentimental watercolour postcards, which were popular, but of little aesthetic merit compared to his poster work. He went back to Milan in 1912 to work for the highly prestigious publishing house Ricordi, and he stayed there for the next five years, at which point he left to join their business rival MAGA and collaborated with them until 1923. By 1924 he'd gained enough experience to be able to set up his own publishing house with business partner Angelo Morzenti in Milan. This venture was successful from the outset and by now as much a businessman as an illustrator 
he travelled to Argentina and set up another agency in Buenos Aires. By this point he was totally in control of his style and technique and clients were eager to be associated with him. In the following decade he used his talent to great effect on an astonishingly wide range of imaginative advertising campaigns. Mozan developed a style that set him apart from others. There were elements of Art Deco evident in his work, but that was balanced with more gesturally applied drawing and painting too. He was playful and humorous in his approach, with visual metaphors and symbols which he used with occasional grotesque surrealism. He seemed to be quite happy to mix his media, even with any given picture, with both flat and tonal painting, and line work created with both brush and crayon. The end result was always visually energetic, with a finish that was both engaging and memorable, like all successful advertising should be. In 1933 he moved yet again to Paris, and although he found plenty of work, he quickly became aware that the French capital was a highly competitive and overcrowded market. And although he continued to use Paris as his base of operations, he nevertheless continued to work in the main for Italian and Argentinian clients. And on occasion he ventured into other areas of expression, such as his agreeably absurd line illustrations for Paul Rabu's humorous book Gérard Chez les Focs in 1934. He continued to work in Paris until the Second World War began in 1939, and he spent increasing amounts of time on the French Riviera, well away from the harsh realities of German occupation. Once the war had ended, Mozan began to scale back his involvement with commercial illustration, and by the mid-1950s he'd retired completely, with more than 2,000 posters to his credit. He spent the rest of his days on the Riviera, painting and enjoying life, up to his death in 1952, at the age of 69. Harry Steele Savage was born in 1898 in Michigan to Irish and French Canadian immigrant parents. He studied at the Art Institute of Chicago and the Slade School of Art in London. And when he'd finished there, he headed to Europe for yet more study in both Vienna and Paris. By 1918, it seems he was working as a commercial artist for a Detroit department store but there's no evidence of his work there or anywhere else for that matter until 13 years later in 1931. In that year his illustrated edition of Boccaccio's Decameron was published and his images for the book immediately set him apart from most of his peers as he was one of very few commercial illustrators using traditional woodcut techniques. And it was immediately obvious that he was highly adept with this particularly difficult method of image making. In the following year he undertook another commission to illustrate the stories of the Arabian Nights and once again he created a series of dramatic and aesthetically pleasing woodcuts. Only a few months later his edition of the droll stories of Honoré de Balzac was also published. But following this prolific period there follows another gap, this time of eight years, before he surfaced again with illustrations for the book No Other Man by Alfred Noyes in 1940. In that year he returned to more classical themes again for stories of the gods and heroes by Sally Benson and the creative success of his woodcuts, this time featuring the range of well-applied spot colours, sealed his reputation for historical and mythological subjects. In 1942 the most successful of these was Mythology by Edith Hamilton. The cover art for this book also demonstrated what Steel Savage could do with colour. When America entered the war following the bombing of Pearl Harbor, he was too old to fight, but he produced some compelling domestic propaganda to aid the American war effort. In the later 1940s and throughout the 1950s, he continued to be in great demand for mythological bookwork. But around this time he also branched out in terms of his subjects and use of media with a series of books about religion and particularly biblical stories. He didn't abandon the woodcuts, but there were also quite a few full colour paintings created with tightly controlled gouache and watercolour. These religiously themed books continued into the 70s, and from the mid 1960s onwards, they were joined by a series of covers he created for science fiction paperbacks. In 
and despite his advancing years, he remained particularly prolific in this genre, right up to his death in 1970, at the age of 71. Jean Brüller adopted the alias Verso for both his writing and his illustration work, but outside France, neither his real name or his alias are familiar. He was born in 1902 in Paris, and with his family he spent the years of the Great War in Switzerland. In 1920 he left school and enrolled onto an electrical engineering course, but even at this stage he was already supplying cartoon illustrations to Parisian magazines. In 1923 he graduated with his degree in engineering and immediately attempted to establish his own magazine, but it wasn't a success. In 1926, following national service in the army, he published his first collection of drawings, 21 Recipes for Violent Death. This series of loose line and watercolour cartoons was a clear indication of Brill's bleak and sardonic humour. By this time his work was appearing regularly in the magazines Luria and Fantasio, and his book A Man Chopped Into Pieces was published and met with some success. In 1930, his agreeably absurd doodles for André Morois' children's book, Patapou Fay Filifa, also appeared, and this book became an instant children's classic. It was translated into quite a few different languages, and it's still in print in several countries. 1932 saw the publication of Le Mariage de Monsieur Laconique, a farcical and engagingly loosely drawn comic book, and it proved to be particularly popular. The success of these books gave him a good income, which left him free to try establishing another magazine, but once again the project failed. So he carried on with his writing and illustration, for adults and children, up to the German occupation of France in World War II. Brüller immediately joined the army, but following a broken leg he had to return to civilian life. He secretly became active in the French resistance and began publishing under the name Verso to avoid detection. And his most acclaimed book, Le Silence de la Mer, was published under this alias, although oddly he didn't create the illustrations. Although he had survived the war, it had left its mark on him and his work. He continued to write and to illustrate his own books but the humour and child-friendly aspects of his work were replaced with an altogether more cynical, darker outlook. In the 1950s, he withdrew from the rest of society and kept very much to himself. But in 1965, he published his illustrated edition of Shakespeare's Hamlet. This project had taken him ten years to complete, but even if his output had slowed, the distinctive visual qualities remained as strong as they had ever been. He was still writing up to his death at the age of 89 in 1991. And I'll be back with another just as soon as it's ready. See you then.